I don't sound like Kathleen Turner anymore. Uh, I, my voice is getting better after COVID, and so thank you for your patience last week. I wanted to welcome you here this morning, and I would like to, if, if you would, please stand. We are going to read from 2 Peter, and this is the Word of God. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers in the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of your sinful desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the, the brightness of the sun. We thank you for the crisp, cold weather. We pray for those who can't be with us this morning, and we pray you would bless them wherever they're at, that they would be able to participate uh, in the preaching of the word and appreciate and be blessed by the singing. We thank you for the gas family that they drove all the way over in the snow, and we pray, Father, that you would prepare Nate's heart to speak to us this morning. Thank you for the chance to come together under your rule, under your guidance, by your Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus, and to glory to God the Father, in Jesus' name, amen, amen.
First Baptist Church, thanks for coming in out of the cold. It doesn't feel too bad in here, does it? Well, we're all excited to see everybody and be here in the house of the Lord. Uh, the refrain so far from Hebrews to date is, Jesus is better. And we're, and we're starting to take that into ourselves. correct? I don't think Nate's going to contradict that today. Pretty confident in that. And we've, we've learned that Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the first covenant. The first covenant's place, it's priests, it's sacrifices. Jesus makes better promises. He gives us a better hope, a better country. He is the better possession. Jesus is gain. Jesus is better. grateful to Jesus for his sacrifice on the cross for us and we are eternally grateful because he is in heaven right now interceding for us before the throne of God.
ushers come forward God's economy is vastly different from ours God's economy Jesus is better God's economy is vastly different from ours we give not because God needs we give because he's given us so much it's our chance to say this is yours Lord all of it is and this is a way that we give back uh, and that we allow God to multiply what we've given. Father, we thank you for the chance to bring tithes and offerings as part of our worship. To be able to look to you as the only provider and sustainer and giver of all things. Lord, what we have, you receive the glory for. If we've stolen it, forgive us. We pray, Father, that we would give with joyful and glad hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a few minutes. Uh, if you're the children here and you want to go to Children's Church, we just want to bless you and send you to do that. And if you'll just take a couple minutes, and uh, I, I'm thinking rub somebody's cold feet, maybe. I don't know. That's an, that's an option. If you've got really cold feet, um, most people will say no to you. But, uh, or you could just tell somebody hi and tell them they love them and that uh, you're glad they're here and that they brave the cold.
I'm reading from Psalm chapter 11. To the choir master of David, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain, for behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted the arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright upright shall behold his face. As we prepare our hearts to hear the word of God, the chorus of the song, ancient words, ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. So I pray that the Lord will open the eyes of our heart. If our lives are a story, which I believe that they are, God blesses us with characters that become essential in the making of that story. I was trying to figure out, Nate is one of those, and has been for many, many years. I think that We're fortunate in our lives if we find one person to walk alongside of us and say, you too? You enjoy that too or appreciate that? We have made fun of each other, cried together, wept, grieved, worked, wrestled over the word, taught together, and I can't think of anybody uh, better 
uh, to come and share uh, in the pulpit. I don't believe it's right for a pastor to hog a pulpit. I believe it's important to find people that, that are better communicators, that, that do a, a great job of being faithful to the word. But I have to say this one last thing. I was trying to figure out whether I was more excited to introduce Nate to you or to introduce you to Nate because you're my family and my tribe. And so uh, I have many other things I could say about Nate and I'm sure he's probably gonna say something about me and it, that part's not true. Um, let's pray for Nate that he might bring the word faithfully. Lord, I pray that you would give Nate the words today to speak. Lord, that you would hide him. Lord, we know that as we come as preachers, we don't come with our own words. We don't come in ourselves. We don't come to uh, press our own agenda. Our whole goal is to be fiercely faithful, to speak your word and not our own. So I pray that you would give Nate uh, the spirit that you would humble him, and that you would use him in mighty ways. And thank you for the chance to meet together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. Uh, thanks for coming out on this balmy uh, morning. Uh, it's good to gather together. And uh, Brian, it's been really encouraging to see Brian kind of get some wind back in his sails. And uh, we chat, I don't know, probably once a week. And uh, he speaks very highly of you guys as his church. Uh, and he's loving uh, ministering to you guys and ministering with you guys. And so I appreciate, I feel like I get to hand him off now. Like he's your responsibility now. So I'm wiping my hands of Brian. And I debated this morning because, you know, I was going to start off by making fun of him. But there's, I couldn't land anywhere. There's so many things. And so I'm just going to, we're going to jump into the word, um, but uh, it is really good to be here. So if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to open up to Psalm 11. We're just going to kind of walk through it a chunk at a time. And I used to coach basketball, and one of the things, we were at Covenant Christian High School, we played in the City Alliance, so we played some really big inner city schools that were really athletic. And inevitably, at some point in the game, they would full court press us because they were just better athletes. They were bigger, they were faster, they were stronger. And if you know anything about basketball, the goal of a full court press is to just speed you up. It's just to get you to forget your fundamentals. You forget how to dribble, you forget how to pass, you start retreating. And as a coach, you gotta call timeout. You timeout, you bring your team over, there's, you're not giving them new information. You're just simply reminding them of their fundamentals. And so this morning, I'm hoping, and this is not from me. I'm sure Brian will say I stole it from him. But preaching is mostly not about giving you new information. Preaching is mostly about reminding just reminding you of truth, because we're so prone to forget. We get full court pressed in our week. We forget the fundamentals. We forget to pray. We forget to encourage one another. We forget to open the word. Uh, we get all stressed out. And I think that's where we are in our culture, right? We look around and we see global conflicts. We see city violence and crime on the rise, political uncertainty, financial instability, and we see evangelical compromise on top of that. And so this morning, I just want to call time out. I want to remind us of what we know to be true about our God, what our purpose is as the church, and hopefully give us a renewed sense of commitment to the sovereign rule of our great God. Now, we don't know when David wrote this psalm, but the central issue expressed in it is timeless. It may have been written at the time when Saul was trying to kill him or when Absalom was trying to steal the kingdom. But regardless, it looks like David's friends are really alarmed when they look around. I picture David sitting around a campfire and one of his friends, you know, they're kind of nervously looking at each other like, are we going to bring this up? And they finally look and they're like, David, we got to get out of here. Things are bad. We are surrounded and it doesn't look good. I imagine David sipping his coffee at this point, taking a, a deep breath. He knew this. He knew how vulnerable he was. But I think it goes deeper than that. It's one thing to be vulnerable, but look at what verse 3 says. And I think it's at the heart of the psalm. What do the righteous do when the foundations are destroyed? Because it's one thing to have your own problems, 
But how disheartening it is when you look out and the very fabric and stability of a culture is crumbling around you. When corruption rules the government, when justice is perverted, when crime is rampant, when something as fundamental as marriage is mocked. And this is why I find it humorous when people say, the Bible is outdated and irrelevant. Are you kidding me? Like this psalm could have been written yesterday. Because is that not the same question that all of us at some point have asked in the last couple of years? What are we to do? What are the righteous to do when the foundations are being destroyed? And so we don't know the exact circumstances for David, but it's clear that he looks around and he sees the social order crumbling. Society was in disarray. God's word was being neglected in Israel. His justice being ridiculed. His laws were being questioned. His commands rejected. And it's no different today. We slaughter our children and we call it choice. We celebrate sexual promiscuity and call it freedom. We redefine marriage, gender, and morality in the name of tolerance. Pornography is labeled as art. Violence is our entertainment. Vulgarity pervades our music. Authority is mocked. Sin is dubbed a disorder. And God's very existence is denied. But the greatest illustration, I think, of how far we've fallen in our culture is the lack of shame and embarrassment. Things that were once kept hidden are now brought out and they're flaunted and they're celebrated to the point where we now call some of these shameful behaviors courageous. It's a fulfillment of the end of Psalm 1 where God gives them over and sin makes sin make sin and people reinvent ways of doing evil and people noddingly approve of it. And aren't we asking these same questions? What are we to do when this is happening? You see, this is practical theology. This is not theoretical it's Isaiah 5 playing out right before our eyes. Isaiah 5, 18 says, Woe to those who draw iniquity to themselves with falsehood, who draw sin as with cart ropes. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Friends, our culture is pulling evil to itself and daring God to come and judge us. We think we're so mighty but we can't even handle disagreement without hurting somebody's feeling. We think we're so wise, we don't even know what bathrooms to choose. Things that should be so fundamental and foundational in our culture no longer are. The only rule is that everyone gets to make their own rules, but take no responsibility for breaking them. In fact, responsibility has been replaced by therapy, and we never get to our great and foundational need, reconciliation with our Creator God. In our culture, we are the foundation on which we build on, and we all know in an honest moment how stable you really are. So what should the people of God do? Now before we look at our options, I want you to notice what David starts off with in Psalm 1. He starts off with a declaration to remind himself, in the Lord I take refuge. Before he even gets anywhere else, he reminds himself, this is my fundamental truth. This is the umbrella under which all of these rhetorical questions and threats and dangers must be read. It's important to note that David doesn't start with how he's feeling. Who cares how he's feeling? His feelings won't change anything. And besides, they're likely to be different in two minutes anyway. He doesn't even start with what he thinks. We can't believe everything we feel, nor can we believe everything that we think. We lie to ourselves all the time. This is why Paul tells us, take every thought captive, because thoughts come from within. Take them captive, put handcuffs on them, and put them under the revealing and searing heat of God's word. In other words, spend more time preaching to yourself than listening to yourself. So before David starts answering these questions, he preaches to himself, in the Lord I take refuge. Now, once that is established, he can begin to ask these questions. What do the righteous do when the foundations are crumbling? And I think David gives us three options. The first is that he can retreat. This is the advice that his friends are giving him. They say, David, let's get out of here. Let's run for the hills. And it's a perfectly understandable solution. Who among us has not looked around and been like, I got to get out of here. I told someone recently that, that pastoring has made me long for the sweet release of death. And I'm not saying it's because of the sheep, although there are days. But it is trying to navigate the, all of the issues in our culture and trying to raise kids. It's like, man, Jesus, come back. Like, you're better. Come back. Come gather your people. So many failed marriages. So many men struggling with pornography. So many teenagers. I'm teaching again right now. And these, these young people looking for meaning and direction in a way that I don't think has ever happened in the world and this is just in the church. 
So what parents not looked out, raised kids and said, man, we got to get out of here. I, I don't know how to do this. And that's why that first verse is so vital because if God is a refuge for his people, then being with him is the safest place to be. We're safer with our God in a war zone than we are in a hidden fortress without him. See, when our kids were little, I have four girls. When they were little, uh, our favorite vacations were to go to Colorado. And we would put kids in our backpack and they'd be walking. And we were in the mountains. It was dangerous. There were mountain lions. There were bears. There were storms. There were cliffs. Things that if I was not with them, this would be really, really dangerous. But they were safer with me there than if we had left them back home without me. That's what, Paul, or that's what David is trying to get these people to understand. He is the refuge. And we can say that running to the hills is not the solution because if it had been, Jesus would not have said this prayer. He says, Lord, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Church, we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and we have been commanded to make disciples and to yield to the temptation to isolate ourselves and abandon the calling that God has given us to preserve the world as salt and to expose evil as light. We do this because we proclaim the gospel. And in fact, this, there may be no better opportunity in the history of the United States than what we have right now to see those dividing lines. Well, the second option we have is we can retaliate. And while this is not expressed explicitly in the psalm, it was a possibility for David. Verse 2 says, The wicked bend their bow. They have their arrows drawn. They're ready to ambush. And as a warrior, David could have thought, You guys want war? You got war. He'd ripped lions apart. He'd killed Goliath. And so we know that David did, was not uh, averse of fighting. But this is not what he's determined to do here. He doesn't raise an army and train them in the same tactics. But sadly, too many Christians are doing that in our culture. I hear so much shouting and yelling coming from the church. No wonder we're often perceived as angry and bitter people. The church in, the, in many circles is bending its bow and fitting its arrows and hiding in the shadows the same way. We snipe, at fa we snipe on Facebook or gossip about our ungodly neighbors. Instead of praying for our leaders, we speak poorly of them. And I get it. I struggle with all of that stuff too. Now make no mistake, I'm not saying that we are not called to do battle. We absolutely are. David fought. In Ephesians 6, Paul gives us the... Uh, the, the the weaponry with how we adorn ourselves, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. We fit our feet with the readiness of the gospel and we extinguish flaming darts with the shield of faith. But notice nowhere in there are we given anything to shoot. Instead, we're told to take up the sword of the spirit. And what is that? That is God's word and we're told to pray continually. Those are our offensive weapons, God's word and prayer. And this passage in Ephesians 6 is a call to spiritual warfare. It is a call from our commander to wage war through prayer and the preaching of the word. But since much of the church today has disregarded the word, we find ourselves simply too busy to pray. We have no other way to engage in spiritual conflict. And so we just get in the mud with the world and we engage on their terms. Church, look, I know that there is so much wrong with our culture. But truly, how much time have you spent praying for your enemies? But instead, we match anger for anger. When they shout, we shout. We sling the same mud and slander at our enemies. And I believe miss out on a ton of opportunity to dialogue with grace, patience, mercy, compassion, and conviction for a world that's so desperately looking for something to put its feet on. And we rarely offer a stable alternative to the shifting sand of our culture. And I'm amazed at how often we as a church put our hope in politics, for instance, and believe that with just a, a legislative stroke of the pen or one more Supreme Court justice, things are going to be solidified. That might happen. That may be what the Lord does. But that is not where our ultimate hope lies. We're often like Peter in the garden in all of his passion. He's just grabbing a sword and just swinging away. And we are chopping ears off all over the place. And God's walking behind us and patching things up and saying, Nate, you need to calm down just a little bit. Remember, your kingdom is not of this world. But we forget and we wage with our enemies in, in similar ways that they fight. We vilify our opponents who we don't agree with. And the vitriol that flows from our mouth, it often shows no distinction with how we love our enemies. Because we don't really believe, verse 1, that the Lord is our refuge. 
It'd be interesting that if evangelicals were as passionate about the proclamation of the gospel as they are about promoting a political candidate, how often we hold up a political sign which will immediately ostracize half of the people, but we will never hold up Christ for fear of ostracizing ourselves. Where's your refuge? The government? Bank accounts? Our health and long life? Your great treasures? We've heard multiple times this morning that Jesus is better. He's the one that conquers sin and death. He certainly can take care of you. It's kind of like sleeping in a tent. If any of you have been camping, I used to take a boys at Covenant. We'd go out west and, um, you know, for some of us, the first time they'd ever camped. And a couple of times we had some bear run-ins. And you realize the tent, you feel secure in a tent, but you're really just a nylon wrapped burrito. Like, it's just ready packaged food for that bear, right? But it feels, it, you feel secure in it. And I think that's when we're putting our security in that thing. It's like being in a tent. But when the tornado comes or the bear comes, you really realize how vulnerable you are and you want something solid. And this is what David proclaims in Psalm 61, 1 through 3. He says, Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. And I love this line Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. David knows that he needs something transcendent. He needs a rock that is far higher than he is. He's weak. He needs protection. And he doesn't ask for a bigger sword, more arrows, or more warriors. He prays and he seeks the Lord. He trusts in God as his refuge. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They're standing there. It's a great story. The king says, hey, bow down. And they look around and they go, yeah, we're not going to do it. He said, no, no, no. If you don't bow down, you go to the furnace. And you've got to love how they respond, right? They didn't look around and be like, okay, you could take out those five, and you could take out those five. We could probably make a run. Let's calculate how to do this. They just say, king, we can't buy out of your idol. Our God forgives it, or for, forbids it. And should you throw us in the fire? I love this. Our God can save us, but even if he chooses not to, we're still not going to bow. What a testimony. This is what it means to take refuge in the Lord. It doesn't mean that we don't resist. And I can't say that clearly enough. We need to resist in this culture. But I do think that our posture and attitude before our enemies demonstrates to a watching world that our hope is in the bedrock promises of our eternal God. We have to engage. I think the church has done a poor job of engaging in many ways. I was a social studies teacher for 12 years. I'm fully convinced that as we need to use all the tools we have at our disposal, and that certainly includes voting. It certainly includes our resources, everything that God has given us to do. But I'm telling you, bombastic and mean-spiritedness can be a barrier to gospel proclamation. And with every angry chant and demeaning word, we lose the ability to say with Paul that we do not wage war the way the world wages war. We lose the testimony of people seeing in our lives the allegiance and confidence we have to a higher king and certainly a greater hope than anything Washington can give us. And that's why it's vital that we keep the gospel central every single day. Because many times we look around at the actions of those who seem to be eroding the foundations and we despise them. But friends, the gospel reminds us the only difference between them and us is the grace of God to me. That is it. And as a result, there should be a very gracious and kind battle that we wage. Pity and mercy should precede anger and frustration. Grace and kindness don't have to be weak. They can be severe and they can be convicting, but they've got to be present. Alistair Begg puts it really well when he says, until the church learns how to cry, the church loses any right to shout. Do we see our sin laid bare before the cross? Do we recognize the gift of salvation and renewed birth? Again, don't misunderstand me. We do have an obligation to engage. We are salt and we are light. And I believe that we are called to expose evil, but I also believe we're called to extend grace, love, and uncompromising goodness even to those who hate us. Remember, Jesus reminds us that our love will be our defining mark that we are his. And so we can't exhaust, we, we exhaust that concept, I suppose, but I want you to get the overarching point. We cannot retreat. We cannot retaliate. And so what are we left to do when the foundations crumble? We refocus. We call time out and we refocus. And I think this is what David does in four through seven. Let me read it again. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous. 
But his soul hates the wicked, and the one who loves violence, let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. And this is the promise. The upright shall behold his face. This is where David calls time out. I remember one time I was watching uh, Michael Jordan play. This is, I, I start dating myself. So I work with kids now and they're like, I don't, he's that really good basketball player, right? It's like, I didn't realize I got so old. But I remember watching, I think they were playing the Pistons one time and it was like 1.7 seconds left or, I mean, just a few seconds and it, the, the Bulls were down one. And the coaches call timeout and the Pistons go to their bench and they're frantically running around. He's the coach is drawing up something and you know, they're kind of, you can see them kind of, they're nervous, they're doing their thing and they pan over to the Bulls bench. Nobody's talking. They're all sitting around. I think Scottie Pippen's throwing a towel at somebody. Steve Kerr's sitting around kind of laughing. Phil Jackson's not even doing anything and the Bulls go out and they end up winning the game. And after the, at the press conference, they asked Steve Kerr, they said, hey, like you guys were calm. Like the Pistons were nervous. Like you guys were calm. Uh, what was going on there? Did you, you guys didn't know what to do? And they said, we have Michael Jordan. We had my, like it didn't matter. Like we're perfectly good. We have Michael Jordan. And so this is what I think David is confessing as he takes his refuge in the Lord. He's like, I got, the, I got the sovereign king. Nothing is going to happen that, that he is not ordained. He's in control of it all. And so he takes the focus from the crumbling foundations. He takes the men, he lifts their chins, and he says, that's the throne room of God. And that's what I want to do this morning. Remind us as a supreme and good rule of our God. If you want to take your eyes off the decay of justice and look to the perfect judge, I want to lift your eyes from the hopelessness that many of you feel this morning and remind you, as David does, that the upright will behold the very face of God one day. And I love the flow of the psalm from verse 1, this rhetorical question of absurdity. How can you say, flee to the mountains? My God is on the throne. Verses 2 and 3 are this factual acknowledgement, but with a side of defiance. Sure, the wicked bend their bow, but my God is my refuge. And then verses four through seven, David's word, it caused the heart to soar with this grandeur of God and this proclamation. And he reminds us of a few things. One, that God exists. He's not disappeared. His silence is not indifference. What does Peter remind us of? God's patience is not slowness. It's there that he might extend time for repentance. And for some of you and for me, man, I'm really glad he did. Right? I'm really glad he did. So God is not indifferent. He's there. David reminds us that God is on his throne. He rules. His inactivity is not weakness or ineptitude. It is his mercy, his mercy that keeps him from crushing his enemies now. But make no mistake, this psalm proclaims it. There will come a day when the crushing of the enemies will happen. There will be an end to the patience. And this psalm testifies to that. So think about the mercy of God that withholds justice on the very enemies that mock him and his laws. We were once those people and God granted us time to breathe and time to repent. This is a gracious God and we would do well to learn from this. When our holy God patiently endures the ridicule that's thrown his way and when he allows the incessant mocking of his bride, the church, it is all for the sake of extending patience for the sake of repentance. But let us be careful that we don't miss the fact that God's judgment does come. God's patience does expire. And one day the enemies hiding in the shadows, they will be wiped out. But that justice is not ours to enact. And David also reminds us that God sees. He sees all that's going on. His rule is not distant. Four times in this psalm, he uses the covenant name for God. He's a personal God. He's not a distant God. He's involved in everything the universe is upheld by the word of his power. He's a near king. He's a knowing king. Nothing is hidden from this king. He sees the wicked in their homes. He knows their secret thoughts. There is no computer screen that is hidden from his view. There is no Facebook page that he does not know about. There is no motive, even the one of your heart, that does not escape his knowledge. And as such, he tests the righteous. And I think this is what these crumbling foundations ultimately reveal for us. This is who the righteous are, and this is who the wicked are. Practice gets old, doesn't it? Like those of you who played sports, if your coach said, all we're going to do is practice all year, 
I don't want to do that anymore. Well, guess what? This is game time. The last 250 years in our culture has been mostly practice for cultural Christianity. But as this gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this is game time. And there is a great opportunity for us here. Because trial plus time equals true colors. You see, the destruction of the foundations is tragic on one front, but it is an opportunity on the other. For when the fault line splits, where will you find yourself? Will you be found clinging to the eroding foundations of your 401k or your sexual identity? Or will you be found resting in the shadow of the Almighty? Will you be hiding in a tent, desperately trying to outlast the storm? Or will you be found sitting peacefully in the cleft of the rock? Will you be like Abraham who left his home because he was looking for a city whose designer and builder was God? We'd be like Moses, who willingly left all the luxury and safety of Egypt because he considered the reproach of Christ infinitely more valuable. We'd be like Paul, who endured beating after beating for the sake of the gospel. Look, friends, I don't know what God is doing. I have no idea. In many ways, I feel like Habakkuk. And if you know the story, it's my favorite minor prophet. Habakkuk's looking around, similar situation. Everything's crumbling. And he's like, God, you've got to do something. And God says, come here, come here. I'm going to do something so amazing. The ears of everyone who hears about it are going to tingle. And Habakkuk's like, yeah, you are. You're going to come and get those people. And Habakkuk, and, and God goes, oh yeah, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to bring the Babylonians in. They're going to wipe you out. And I'm going to take you into exile. And Habakkuk's like, whoa, 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 whoa. That is not the game plan I have. And what do I do? And God says, no, no, no. The, the, the just will live by faith. You need to trust me. You need to trust me. And so then I love how Habakkuk then confesses once he's, once he's got this. Here's what he says. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines. In other words, there's nothing in your pantry. It says the fruit, of the, the produce of the olive fail and the fields bring no food. The flock be cut off and there be no herd in the stalls. I have nothing. And what's he say? I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. What a great confession. He doesn't know what the Lord's up to. And he probably disagreed with God's plan. I have done that multiple times. But he pledges an unwavering commitment to worship God and to lean into him because his faith is not circumstantial and neither can ours be. He doesn't say, as long as things go well, I will worship you. He says, as long as there's nothing going on, I will stand and rejoice in the Lord because he is my strength and deliverer. This is what it means to take refuge in the Lord. I'm reminded of something J. Vernon McGee said. It says, this is God's universe and he does things his way. You may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. Look, friends, God is still on his throne and we don't know his timing, but we know that nothing is beyond his control and that everything he does is for his own glory and for our good. And I'm speculating here, but what if he's allowing the foundations to crumble so that the people of faith might be able to shine all the brighter? What if the immigration crisis is God's way of bringing people to your neighborhoods that you might be able to proclaim the gospel? What if God is emptying storehouses through inflation and everything else, so that we might show a world that we find our ultimate satisfaction in Christ and that we can display it to the world. Look, God has already demonstrated in the cross that his economy is so different from ours. And so here's what I want to leave you with. What do the righteous do when the foundations crumble? The same thing we do when they appear to be stable. We worship the Lord. We proclaim the gospel. We raise our kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. We pray. We work as unto the Lord. Nothing changes for us. But too often we kind of throw around these ambiguous cliches like impact the world for Jesus or transform the culture. And we like those slogans because they're broad and they're faceless. But what if somebody says the best thing that you can do right now is love your wife like Christ loves the church? Well, now there's a face and now there's a responsibility. What's the best thing you can do? Go share the gospel with your neighbors. You can't change the world. I hate to tell you that. I'm not a, very, I'm not a real good motivational speaker, am I? Uh, but I tell my students all the time, you can't change the world, but you can impact your family. You can impact your neighborhood. You can impact your local community, but I don't like my local community. I don't like my family. But the world, that's just kind of this nameless, broad thing, and it's a cliche that I don't know whether I ever accomplish but put a face on it, and now there's a responsibility. So what do we do when the foundations are being destroyed? Here's the takeaway, right? We take refuge in the Lord. We love our neighbors. We love our spouses. We raise our kids to serve Christ, and we work as unto the Lord. 
You may not be able to change the world, but you can impact the people close to you. And sometimes the best thing you can do is lift their chins and say, that's the rock that is higher than me. Look, Jesus Christ is that rock, friends. And all who run to him will find refuge. He is the rock that is higher to us, that is higher than us, to the praise and honor of his great name. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize, uh, man, uh, that we live in a broken world. Uh, and sometimes it is, it is, man, it is broken beyond anything that we can repair. But we thank you that you are the better king. You are the one who will restore and redeem and put all things back together one day when we eagerly anticipate this new heaven and new earth. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd return today. It would be awesome if you return even before this service is over, that we worship here and then find ourselves gazing on the beauty of our risen Lord. Lord, give us a passion for your word and a passion for the glory of Christ. Make us a people who pray, who are quick to hit our knees and people who open our word, open your word regularly. We love you, we thank you, we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Anyone encouraged this morning? Amen. That was a great word. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Challenging word. Hopefully for all of us, it certainly was for me. We're going to, well, let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing this last song. And, and uh, again, we're going to tell Jesus that he is the king of our heart. We choose him. We're thankful that he chooses us. Uh, thank you, brother.
and keep you. May he, may he make his face shine upon you. May he open our hearts through the word and prayer this week that we might see him as our refuge that he is. That he may test the righteous. That he may test our hearts and uncover those things in our lives which are not glorifying and honoring to him. May we realize that God sits in the heavens and may we rejoice knowing that even if the foundations crumble, he is Lord. Have a good week.